we have uh, begun work with a company called Brain Spaces, who is co-founded by Amy, who is here with us today. Um, we've been doing work with Brain Spaces for several months now, um, as we've been planning and working on the renovations and construction of the two new elementary schools. Amy is an architect by training, which is very helpful to this process. The reason why I think it makes her unique and her lens unique is because she also went back and got her teacher's license. It means nothing to have the license, right? She also went back and taught in the classroom. So she has both the pedagogy from teaching in the classroom and the architectural background to blend towards creating amazing learning spaces um, for schools. And so we are glad that her expertise is here with us in Washington Township as she's lending expertise across the state. Um, we're glad to have some of her time as well. Thank you to everybody for coming out. Uh, um, terrific to be here and terrific to represent the architects and educators of the world. Uh, happy um, Teacher Appreciation Week to all your teachers in here. Um, and, to, and to begin to translate all of the work that you guys have been doing over the past years it to define what your spaces should be for your for teaching and learning in this district. So I want to um, qu quickly talk about what we're going to hear about tonight, and that one that is that we, we've just talked about why who we are. Now we'll we'll talk about why we're here, setting the stage so we'll understand what our process is and what to expect along the way, exploring what's possible. So what else is what else is going on in in learning environment design around the the rest of the world. Um, how you can help, so how we hope to hear from you and how we can engage you to help us with this next phase of the, of the work. And then um, stay tuned for what's next, understanding the next steps. So we'll just jump right in. One of the things I wanted to mention is that the, the team that is uh, partnering with your district includes two parts at the moment, uh, three parts if you count you. <laughs> But um, one is my company, Brain Spaces, and we are writing the educational specification, so that recipe of how to implement your, um, your facilities and facility upgrades. And then the architecture team, the CSO that you heard introduce themselves as we went around the room, is doing the architectural design for the new elementaries. Um, and so there's kind of this uh, uh, multi-part approach. We are all also doing the ed specs for K-12, so not just the elementaries. We're going to continue on and continue to define the educational space needs for middle and high, even though right now we're focusing a little more on elementary to get those projects underway. So we're also, of course, have quite the range of uh, inputs and insights to gather from a variety of sources and so uh, the structure of the district is really helpful in, in helping us flesh out all of the needs that are representative of uh, the operational and maintenance and um, other components that we need to consider as we're defining the needs for our school buildings. So one of the other things I want to point out is, is one of the most important stakeholders we like to hear from is the students. And so we see a, for a future student here <laughs> that um, not sure she, uh, she or he's ready to say anything yet, but we will be spending some time in the district actually meeting with student focus groups and getting their opinions and ideas and insights on what's important to them in the design of their uh, learning environments. And so that piece is critical to, uh, critical part of the process as well. So a little, just a tiny bit about, uh, about brain spaces is that we are a company of architects and educators. We bridge that gap between architecture and, and education. And oftentimes we see that there's a couple of different languages being spoken there. So we help translate from, uh, from what the educators need to what the architects should build to support that. Um, so we've also spent quite a bit of time understanding brain-based science and neurological research and how space affects learning, how space affects people, and so we can bring that knowledge into the design of the learning environments as well. Um, we work all around the, uh, around the world, mostly in the U.S., um, and uh, you know, our, uh, we, we've been fortunate to retain some accolades for that work. But mostly what I think is important about the fact that we work all around the world is that we can bring to you some examples of what other people are doing and help share, you know, how is it that, uh, that they're de defining their facilities that maybe we could learn from and we can take some insights from, even though they actually come to us a lot and ask us for insights on how we design our schools as well. 
Um, so when we set the stage, we talk about setting the stage for, d for educational specifications. Part of that is understanding what are ed, ed specs and how are we going to use them, how are they going to be applied to your school facilities. So we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about what ed, ed specs are. So the district, as you know, has gone through quite a bit of effort and energy putting together their vision for education, vision for facilities. And so we're, we're, start, we're not starting from zero here. We're starting with a whole lot of work that's been done over several years to welcome, <laughs> to get you to where you are now. So what we're doing is we're taking that vision, we're taking that exercise uh, of understanding what you've already done, and we're, we're trying to um, translate that into the, you know, into the hows, whos, and whats that we need to do to support those. So how are we going to do that? With, with whom are we, will, we, will we support it? And, and uh, what spaces are going to be required to facilitate that? Hi, yay, we have students. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, um, so we'll use an analogy here to try to help explain, you know, sort of what ed specs do. Um, you know, we've all seen these. This is a, just a plain old styrofoam cup, right? So a styrofoam cup has a purpose. It's used to keep things cold. It's used to keep things warm. It's, it's to drink from. It's not particularly beautiful. It's not, uh, per, you know, it's, but it does its function. So, so we, we have that, and that's essentially our, our current design. That's our, our, our old design of our schools. They were pretty much functional. They weren't necessarily so, uh, um, so uh, sustainable, <laughs> right, in the, the styrofoam way. But uh, we, we take those functions and those ideas and we begin to interpret them. We begin to update them and predict how they might, that what the needs for the future might be as we begin to write the ed specs that would determine what then the design needs to be. So if we think about the, um, about the, the instructions of, of what ed spec should be, they really look at how can we do things better? How can we do things differently? How can we take advantage of new technologies and new materials, new systems, new, um, new, new found interest in sustaining the environment and so forth? And so we could even say that, you know, the, the analogy is that the, the styrofoam cup is our 20th century school and, um, and the new teapot is, is our um, is our 21st century school and frankly even 22nd century school. Um, but the, the thing is that the important thing to note here is we're still having tea, right? We still have kids. We still have the, the, the stakeholders are the same. Um, you know, another uh, analogy was, is, the, is the phone where, um, where we know it, it's, it was intended for a given purpose. So that, applying that analogy to a school and, and our needs of our uh, schools here, um, we can say we, we, we know that these things, you know these things because uh, you've been part of it and you've been, uh, they've been communicated as we need our schools to accommodate capacity, support teaching and learning, be safe and secure, comply with the codes, you know, all these sort of basic, basic things that we know we need to do. Um, so how do, we, how do we translate those into spaces and, and how do we define that educational effectiveness that ended up um, on all of the building plans? And how do we connect students to, um, uh, to the building and the building to learning? So this, the building could possibly be a teaching tool. And then how do we predict the future and allow for our decisions we make now to, to be, uh, be able to address future needs of, of teachers and learners? And so the new design might be something that's, that was never even p possible to conceive of as we were looking at the old design, but it might have additional functionality and a different additional needs that we, did, we didn't even know existed when we first designed that, uh, that, that prototype. So just looking quickly at the timeline, of how we're doing this. The first few uh, meetings, the first few months, we're really looking at combining middle school, uh, elementary school, and high school into uh, combined discussions where we could talk about the continuum of K-12 education district-wide. And then we'll begin to focus on the elementary schools first so we can uh, meet the deadline of developing those new buildings. And then we'll, um, then we'll focus on the middle and high schools when we come back after the winter break. So that's what to expect. Our conversations will be very elementary heavy right now because of that timeline. And then we'll pick up the other components uh, later in the year. 
So what would that look like? You know, what ed specs look like? There's a bunch of examples. You could Google it, as my son would say, Google it. <laughs> that um, it includes the definition of the quantities of spaces, the, the types of spaces, the qualities those spaces should have, as well as how those spaces might um, be located next to each other or how they would be arranged uh, with their adjacencies. So we define what the, the benchmark should be of uh, spaces, qualities, and adjacent and then we can apply those to both new schools and uh, renovated schools. Um, so we look at those things in terms of you know monster spreadsheets as well as diagrams and bubble diagrams and a lot of different ways so we'll be able to share those with you along the way so you can kind of see what's what the, what the thinking is but all these are collaboratively developed with teachers and with students and all the stakeholders you saw in the previous few slides. And so one of the things that we keep hearing, and particularly in the last few sessions that we've had with your, uh, with your staff and teachers and, and community, is the need for more flexibility in the use of classroom spaces and the use of what we have now um, that could, um, could enable a, a new kind of learning, this 21st century learning. And so we often look at how could we, within the confines even of existing space, how can we enhance functionality and enhance that um, ability to offer IB curriculum in a 21st century world. And so we look at examples of how, say for example, within the walls of a classroom we can take one furniture set and have that be able to accommodate a whole bunch of different um, arrangements, a whole bunch of different uh, activities and um, and uh, functions to enable the classroom to do more things to, to um, support more students. And then for the new school, we would look at how those might come together and become a floor plan for an elementary school. This is an example for somebody else, but we will put those together into a building and will become the floor plans for the, um, the new elementaries. So we know what our givens are. We know what the, the, the um, voters approved, you guys approved. And so we have our givens, but we do have a few things that need to be clarified in there. So it's not that we're starting over. We're just diving a little more deeper, deeply into some of the things that have already been advertised and have, that you've already agreed to and, and um, that you've been part of. And so, you know, for example, we're not changing any of these, but, but some of the ones that are um, uh, that are, are more quantifiable are the easy ones to accommodate, but the ones that say more effective educational environments, what does that mean? And so the EdSpec process will help us define what does that mean so that when we go and design the buildings, we, you know, we get it right. So there's a lot of interpretation that's involved in understanding how we go from this part of the process and, uh, and, and this amount of work into the actual implementation of that. And so this is the, the gap that we're filling through this process. And of course, you have um, the givens outlined for all of the, all of the sites so far. An example of, uh, of what we, we do when we're looking at how to apply those ed specs or those standards to existing facilities is that we, we define what we think, like for example, elementary is what we think all elementaries ought to have. And then we overlay that, those benchmarks, onto your existing floor plans. And we note where there's alignment and where there might be some disconnect or some in, in, inefficiencies or ineffectiveness. And then we try to come up with some strategies, strategies to bring those existing facilities into closer alignment with what the district sees as, as the benchmarks for all those uh, and standards for, for facilities in, um, across the district. So, so that's how we will apply it. We're good? We're questions? We're good? Okay, so when we, we start with this, we also look at what's possible. In terms of education, we look at precedents, we look at research, we look at what, uh, what we might be able to do in, in our, in our um, further definition of that educational effectiveness uh, component. So as we looked at this a minute ago, we want to really say this is where, this is our past and we know, we know what our past looks like, but what is the future look like? And that's a little bit more difficult, but it's also a little more fun to explore. And what might that be for our uh, students of, of our community in the future? Um, so one of the things, I've, as I mentioned earlier, we spend a bit of time trying to un understand how um, architecture and space affects us physiologically, neurologically. And so we, this is just uh, one source, which I highly recommend. It's called Welcome to Your Child's Brain. And it, uh, it's written for parents, so it's a really good read. Um, but it talks about some of the things, that, there's a lot of things in there. We just pulled out some of those, those items that we feel have a direct impact on facilities. That, that the, uh, 
uh, that the schools need to include enjoyable activities. And I, and I think when we look at our typical schools, uh, um, not necessarily in this district, but uh, around the country, that uh, classrooms uh, organized with students in rows facing the front, that's not necessarily so enjoyable. So how do we allow for the spaces to be able to support something else? Um, but any of you who have kids who play video games know that it doesn't have to be just fun, it also has to be challenging. So, you know, if a game is too easy, they, they quit, they don't go back to it. So it's not all about fun and games. It's about really challenging, but through spaces and activities. Um, and so we, we know a few other things, exercise improves learning, that, that uh, we need to consider the whole child, not just, you know, their heads, and, um, and, and that all of that contributes to positive learning environment, uh, to positive learning. So how do we design the environment that way? One of the things I, I like the, the most is that um, a, a child's internal motivation is is a very, very powerful tool for them to learn. And so we, we need to seek and find and support those internal motivations. And, and while I don't believe that the architecture is the solution, I think it can really enable a different kind of support of students if it's in a, a dynamic way. And so recognizing how do students learn, how do learners learn, um, and what kind of spaces support that. They're usually more dynamic. They don't look like the schools that we went to. Um, there's, uh, there's places for larger groups, smaller groups, different kinds of interactions, different ways of working with the, the walls. Walls aren't just for dividing space anymore. Um, and, and different ways that the color and finishes and lighting can work into, uh, into the, the mix as well. So we know from, uh, even from the CEOs that, that, that Forbes, inter Forbes interviewed that, uh, that the traits of, future, of the future, future successful firms, will include uh, all these um, attributes, but, but particularly collaborative, communicative, creative, and flexible. And, um, and so those are the things that we're focusing on when we try to translate those into environments. Um, <clears throat> and again, when I was in school, you know, collaboration, was called cheating. <laughs> and so um, it, we, things have shifted a bit than, uh, than when we were in school. So we're really designing for, for their future, not really our past. And so even though we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, there's still the need to get together as a group of students. There's still a need to get together and, uh, um, and, and, and study and memorize and, 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 and answer questions. But add to that some additional more dynamic ways of learning and then uh, create the spaces that support that, and that's our um, that's our goal. You know, make mistakes are allowed. Um, that uh, that that uh, instead of just memorizing, let's understand more. These are all the things that you guys are doing already as part of the IB curriculum and as part of of, of what you do. Um, but again, you're often trying to fight your facilities to do that. So we want to make that a little bit easier. Um, keeping in mind that uh, estimates say 65% of the kids in elementary school or, or preschool today uh, will will work in jobs that have, have that don't exist yet, and and they'll be working to solve problems that don't that don't exist yet using technology that hasn't been invented yet. So it's you know it's a pretty daunting task when even we think about uh, building an 80-year building, say the elementary schools. That puts us three years from from the 22nd century. So we're not talking about 21st century necessarily anymore. We're kind of talking 22nd century, building wise. So when we talk about what we want for our kids, I know you have kids, you know, <laughs> uh, what we want for them is, is for them to be creative and engaged and independent and intelligent and, and, uh, and interactive and healthy and all, and then we give them spaces like this. Now, I just want to point out that this is a classroom that was, um, I snapped this picture, it's, the classroom is in Honolulu. And so you walk out of those doors and you are in paradise. But in here, it's like sensory deprivation. Um, and so, you know, space matters. What are we telling our students when we, when we offer them spaces like this and we expect them to be happy and enjoy learning? Um, so again, we think there's a, new, there's a new approach to that. And it's not the factory model that we all went to school. It's not that, that easy. It's, all students don't learn the same. All, um, all teachers don't teach the same. And so the characteristics that we're finding in terms of the, how to create a space that's supportive of 21st, maybe 22nd century learning is that it needs to be, uh, have variety, that it extends uh, beyond the building itself, both in physical space and in time. 
um, that it's more student-centered, uh, there's, they're flexible and various layouts of furniture, hands-on visibility, um, easy access to student support, uh, technology is, can, is, is, a, is a useful and available and always working tool, um, that uh, there's natural light and then there's connections to the outdoors, whether that's physical or, gr or great views. Is any of this resonating with you guys? Good. These are the students for the video. <laughs> Excellent. So it doesn't have to be expensive to be thoughtful, right? So this is an example of a teacher's lounge that, and I was Teacher Appreciation Week now, but this was done a couple years ago. Teacher's lounge where over the weekend before Teacher Appreciation Week, the PTO came in and did this. And um, while well, there's a color shift here on the, on the screen, you can see that by adding some paint, adding some uh, plants, some lamp lighting, some color, you can actually transform a space in, from, a, from a really dreadful concrete block room into kind of a nice tranquil break area. And so we're not talking about every case about spending a lot of money to do it. It can be just thoughtful and creative ways of making space better than, than it is now. Um, another example of that, and I know you've seen a lot of these kinds of spaces where you have just uh, you know blank walls where we could activate it by by uh, display or by um, sharing uh, books or other things that we can really make an environment environment more inspiring. Um, I love the idea that that learning can be fun, and that uh, perhaps there we know that swinging has a, a, a benefit to the development of, the, of a child's brain. How about we also extend that into uh, into the learning uh, curriculum as well? And maybe spaces don't look like the spaces that we went to when we were in school. Maybe they're a little bit more fun. Maybe they're a little more dynamic. Um, maybe they're uh, more interactive and, and there's more variety, more color. So, um, so you know, we want to uh, suspend our disbelief for a moment and think what's possible. Maybe we write on the walls. Uh, maybe those walls are clear. Maybe, um, maybe they're colorful and they're fun. Would you like this space? Yeah, right? So I just want to point out big eyes and a head shake. <laughs> um, and, uh, and you know, maybe there's a, there's a wall or, or areas where you see world clocks. I mean, it's IB. So, you know, we could, we could incorporate those kinds of curricular elements into the building design itself and, and help uh, strengthen the programs that you're already doing. Uh, example of an elementary school in Chicago where this is the this is the um, uh, exit stair, but in the exit stair they have a skylight, and on the skylight they made it into a sundial. So as the students are going up and down the stairs, they have access and they see this uh, the sundial. This is a library space um, in um, in an elementary school, and here is a piece of sculpture, percent for art program where. Um, that uh, th this pole is connected to the, the electrical uh, usage of the building and the more it lights up, the more the students know how much electricity is being expended at that given time in the building. So they can kind of see, you know, if it's a rainy day out, maybe that's more lit up than it is when it's a sunny day out and the lights are automatically off. So again, how do we make this, uh, the building a teaching tool and a fun place to be? This also happens to have a slide in the library. So, um, you know, it can be fun, but it might be a little crazy. Um, you know, places where students can get together and, and, uh, and gather, and maybe this is their, their mascot are the eagles, and so we did this eagle's nest in their uh, student commons where students can kind of uh, go in and, and have group projects outside of their, of their classroom space. This is in Joplin, Missouri. Um, an example of um, a place where we could rethink the way we use hallways, um, that perhaps we can transform that hallway into a useful space, a fun place to be, just by the uh, addition of the right kind of attributes and the right kind of furniture. Um, this, this is nice because you get to put those, fold those back into the wall and they can still clean the floors, you know, so we need to balance those, uh, those components as well. A library space in Chicago, it's a, a space about the size of this room, it's really tiny uh, for a small school, but, um, you know, it has a high volume, it has good graphics, it has good color, it has cool furniture, it has a genius bar, you know, it, co it covers all of those bases. It doesn't have to be a huge space to get to have a high impact and high functionality. So. There's also, do you guys have VR headsets? No? Yeah, so they're just coming out, you know, where you're, there's a few people I know that have them, but 
Um, but so virtual reality is, is coming just uh, just like when I was a kid, people said, oh, technology. I'm like, what? You know? So this is a new, uh, a new direction, and we're not sure how it's going to affect uh, learning environments. But it could extend our learning environment into a world that would allow us to access things we wouldn't normally be able to access. So we need to stay abreast of what, uh, what's coming down the pike so we can accommodate that in our, in our learning environments. Um, and so you might ask, well, how, uh, how can we help? Um, what we're looking for is your feedback on some example, exemplar spaces that have, have uh, components or attributes that, that you might like or might not like. We have, uh, as, as, an as the architect side of me says, the, um, uh, the picture is worth a thousand words. So if we communicate in pictures, we could maybe get closer to what everybody's thinking than if we just try to talk about it. So we've created a, a, a survey that is online and that uh, will, is, is live, will be um, emailed out or available on the website in the next day or so for everyone to go and give us their feedback on a variety of different kinds of spaces and how you react to those spaces. So then we can gather this information and kind of get a better sense of what everyone's expectations are with regard to physical space and in its support of learning. Thank you so much, Washington Township community, for listening to this presentation. We hope it was informative to you, but now it's your turn to give us feedback. Please click on the survey link and take your time to give us feedback on any images that spark your curiosity, your interest, or your desire for the future of Washington Township Schools.